Hello everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Anne Nicholson and I'm the Acting Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 White Memorial Lecture. I'd like to start on behalf of Monash University by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners and elders, both past and present, of the land on which we stand, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic life. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Brian McMullen, who is a trustee of the White Fund, and he will acknowledge Jean and Phyllis White and their bequests. Please come up, Brian. Good evening all. Uh, it's my duty and a, a pleasant duty as trustee of Jean White and for many years her deputy at Monash University to say something about the background to the present series of White lectures. Uh, by now many of you will by dint of attending some or all of the previous lectures, seven of them, this is the eighth, will be familiar with what I'm about to say. But as, as I've remarked on a previous occasion, there's always someone in the audience who's hearing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony for the first time, <laughs> or Tchaikovsky's First Piano Concerto, or what other war horse you, you care to uh, designate. Uh, White, as you've already uh, been told, denotes two people. Uh, the sisters, Jean Primrose White, the elder, and Phyllis Primrose White, uh, their father was Edward Primrose White. Uh, Primrose is a family name which seems to originate in Scotland. Uh, they lost their mother while Jean was still a toddler uh, and they were brought up on a sheep farm north of Port Augusta in South Australia where father Edward was the manager and brought up by father and their mother's sister who became their stepmother. Uh, they always referred to her as Auntie. Uh, the girls went to boarding school in Adelaide and eventually, uh, after the Second War, uh, did honours degree in English at the University of Adelaide. Uh, as far as the Monash connection is concerned, uh, Jean is obviously the uh, closest. Uh, against the wishes of father and auntie, uh, neither of whom saw the benefit of tertiary education for girls. Uh, Jean enrolled as a part-time student at the university and to support herself she went along to the public library, now the state library, which was on the same uh, North Terrace uh, to s seek a job. Uh, just. The proximity was what mattered. Uh, she was taken on and as she later put it, she caught the library bug. She was fortunate in the sense that this was in the early 1940s during the Second World War when some of the male members were away on active duty and so she was able to assume certain duties that were technically preserved for the men. And among her duties was staff development and she embarked on a program of teaching to the institute syllabus. Uh, and it, it seems that she taught absolutely everything. Uh, this period in Adelaide was the basis for <coughs> her long time interest in education for the profession which saw her serve for many years on the board of education of the Library Association of Australia and as editor of the Australian Library Journal. After uh, many years in Adelaide, she spent a long period at the University of Sydney, followed by a brief and eventually unhappy period at the National Library of Australia, before being appointed in 1975 as the Foundation Professor of Librarianship 
uh, in the Graduate School of Librarianship at Monash University. Uh, you could say that her career had been leading to this appointment and she was proud to be titled Professor. She, she in fact, insisted on being called Professor. <laughs> not, not Miss White, uh, Ms. White. Uh, she retired somewhat reluctantly at the end of 1988, having reached the statutory retirement age at that time of 65. Of Phyllis, or Billy, as she was generally known, I presume that's a, um, um, a process of Phyllis, Philly, Billy. So she was uh, even silly Billy, possibly, uh, knowing the relationship between the two uh, sisters. Uh, I can say much less. Uh, she never left Adelaide and spent the whole of her life as a well-regarded high school English teacher. Uh, last year, I likened her to one of Thomas Gray's mute, inglorious Milton's born to blush unseen, and I can think of nothing better uh, than, than that. Uh, Jean died in 2003, uh, Billy in 2005. Uh, neither of them married, and they had no close relatives. In her will, Jean made a number of specific requests, including a substantial one to Monash University Library in support of the collections in librarianship, English, and philosophy. Uh, the residue of her estate she left to the university to support research and publication in librarianship, archives, and records. Uh, by the time that she made her will, the graduate school had become the Department of Librarianship, Archives, and Records. Uh, these strands are now specialisations within the Faculty of Information Technology, your hosts this evening. In her will, Billy left sums to support various of her sister's interests, including support for the library and for research and publication in librarianship, archives and records. Hence, the white of our title embraces the two sisters, Jean and Phyllis White. I need only add that the committee set up to administer the bequests has been awarding grants to students and staff in keeping with the sisters' intentions. And in order to reach a wider community, as tonight, has instituted this lecture series, of which this is now the eighth. And at this point, I will invite Ross to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Ross. Um, some of you may get a feeling of deja vu um, because I was the seventh white memorial lecturer. But um, let me, without further ado, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Alex Byrne. Um, Alex is a fellow of the Australian Library and Information Association and until his retirement last month, and he's still, looking, still smiling about it, I think. Um, he was New South Wales State Librarian and Chief Executive from September 2011. This followed positions in library and university management across Australia most recently at, uh, as university, university Librarian and Pro Vice-Chancellor Teaching and Learning at the University of Technology, Sydney. Alex served for a decade in leadership positions with IFLA, and I have to say at this stage, librarians really like acronyms. So for non-librarians, I'll spell them out as well. Um, he was in leadership positions with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, including being president from 2005 to 2007. Uh, the first Australian to hold this position and um, one of only two from the Southern Hemisphere so far. So over the last two years, Alex chaired, now this one I'm not sure how to pronounce, Nisla, Nisla, the National and State Libraries Australasia, the vibrant partnership of the National State and Territory Libraries of Australia and New Zealand. Um, so that really is collaboration in action. As a professional librarian, researcher, and writer, Alex has a deep interest in the roles of memory institutions, the complexity of issues relating to indigenous peoples and transmission of knowledge, 
and the opportunities and challenges of the digital age. He was honoured with the HCL Anderson Award from uh, the Australian Library and Information Association in 2015. And on a personal note, it's been my pleasure as a journal editor over um, recent years to publish articles by Alex. They are always a pleasure to receive. They are very literate indeed, very thoughtful and well constructed. And I'm sure we're going to hear something very similar today. So welcome, Alex. Thank you, uh, Anne, Brian and Ross, and thank you all for coming. It's a, a full room on this uh, cold evening. I too uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wiradjuri of the Kulin Nation, pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present. A very important statement for those of us who value uh, knowledge and the transmission of knowledge and are committed to uh, informed and literate societies. I'm going to talk this evening about uh, a long-held preoccupation of mine, which is about the, the nature of the library profession, but situating it more broadly in the information professions. And I feel very honoured to be invited by um, Monash University's Faculty of Information Technology and the committee uh, to give uh, this lecture, this oration, uh, in honour of the White Sisters and particularly Jean White. I, I didn't really know Jean White because uh, uh, I was working in other places towards the end of her career and uh, early in my career I met her a few times but she was certainly uh, somebody uh, that we uh, respected and took great note of. Some years ago, a IT uh, director, uh, he headed IT at ANU at that time, uh, said, well, you librarians are just minders of highly processed wood pulp and you're designed, uh, you will fade out. Well, we haven't faded out, we're still here. but." Will the information profession disappear? Um, will we be replaced by technology? That was certainly a, a common concern and jibe in the 1990s. Uh, will we go the way of bus and tram conductors, stenographers, of many occupations that existed until quite recently and have now have disappeared? I was reading recently about the finance industry uh, where I worked at the State Library of New South Wales. We are in the heart of uh, finance land with banks and insurance companies and merchant banks and so huge enterprises. People would pour out at lunchtime. Well, the uh, predictions are that that industry will shrink as an employer, uh, perhaps not before time, uh, because what they do can be done better by machines. So what do those questions mean for our profession? Uh, Brian's uh, spoken about uh, Jean White and I'd just like to emphasise that she is such a great leader in the library profession and in the process of professionalisation of the library profession, especially of course in professional education and research in fostering that and continuing to foster it uh, through uh, the White Fund. Uh, Brian noted that she uh, claimed to be a librarian by accident uh, because uh, working at the State Library of South Australia or then Public Library of South Australia was uh, a way to uh, earn an income uh, with the university uh, next door. I don't share that. I'm a librarian by intent. After early training as an electrical engineer, I changed direction, became a librarian, and I've uh, had a wonderful career as a librarian, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, Jean and I have a few uh, areas in common in terms of our uh, strong interest in the profession and in education, and uh, both, as you've heard, uh, 
being awarded the HCL Anderson Award, uh, a really prestigious and uh, um, humbling award. It was particularly, of course, in her role as the foundation professor of the Graduate School of Librarianship at Monash that Jean made her mark. And that really set the scene. It was in what you might call the third phase of professionalisation of uh, library and information work in Australia. And as you can see on the screen, you can probably see it better than I can on this one, uh, she uh, said that very early on, in 1956, that her aim, her intention was to foster graduate training for a graduate profession. There are essentially three phases in the professionalisation of librarianship in Australia. The first, uh, which uh, occurred uh, through uh, the 19th and early 20th century, uh, was the creation of uh, li great libraries like uh, the Public Library of Victoria, now the State Library, uh, Free Public Library of New South Wales, now the State Library, and others elsewhere. Th those institutions saw themselves as professional institutions and derided uh, the preceding subscription institutes and School of Arts libraries as, as amateur. And there were quite acrimonious exchanges which came to fore particularly uh, round the uh, end of the first third of the 20th century uh, following the Munn Pitt Report, which was a review, a scathing review of libraries in Australia, published in 1935. And at that point, it was realised that we really needed better professional structures and better professional education. That led to the formation of the Australian Institute of Librarians, which established professional examinations uh, to qualify uh, for uh, professional membership. That placed a firm line in the sand between the amateurs and the professionals, a line that's perpetuated today in the Australian Library and Information Association's uh, membership requirements, where there is a firm distinction between professional members and other members. That second phase was seen by those who initiated it as a very temporary phase, that the association would only run examinations for a short time. Well, it lasted for about 30 years until this, the growth in higher education in Australia enabled uh, the move of professional courses into the colleges of advanced education, the institutes of technology, and eventually the universities. And that third phase is where uh, Jean White was particularly prominent uh, through the establishment of the Graduate School at Monash. Turning to what is a profession, uh, it's famously, Adam Smith famously called it a conspiracy against the public. <laughs> I don't have the longer quote with me, but it's something along the lines of whenever um, professionals gather together, their discourse is inevitably a conspiracy against the public. And in the classic definition, a profession needs to demonstrate that it possesses, possesses a shared body of knowledge, a commitment to provide service to society, and an agreed ethical foundation. In the process of professionalisation of librarianship and many other professions, those were the, the three watchwords, the three uh, core requirements. And really, that's what you might call a duck strategy. Let's look like a duck. We want to look like the lawyers and the doctors. So uh, as the American poet uh, James Whitcomb Riley put it, when I see a bird that walks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, I call that bird a duck. If we wanted to be seen as professionals, we needed to look like ducks. And we did that assiduously, quacking away. It's essentially 
distinguishing ourselves through exclusion. We're saying these aren't part of our profession. These people are not members of our profession because uh, they don't tick these particular boxes. If we go back to the Institute of Librarians that I just spoke about, their emphasis was on education and experience. In this third phase, as it moved into universities, gradually practical requirements were largely dropped and uh, the emphasis became very much on education and education started to part its ways from practice. Jean White was conscious of some of these things and in this quote from 1984, she uh, firmly says that librarianship is an academic discipline but goes on to chastise us by saying that it uh, occupies a basement in the house of the intellect and it will climb upstairs when, to paraphrase, we get more serious about it, about its research base, about uh, its education and training and a more pervading sense of urgency and purpose. To an extent, her vision was achieved. We have a highly regarded profession. Uh, as you've heard, uh, I've spent many years working internationally in the library field uh, with the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions and particularly representing uh, that body and uh, libraries and information services around the world in the World Summit on the Information Society um, in the middle of the last decade. And I can say uh, with confidence that Australian librarianship is very highly regarded internationally and people look to us. Uh, we have a tradition, uh, mainly because uh, we've been fortunate in uh, being an English-speaking country, of drawing on the best of the Anglo-American tradition, uh, enriching it by looking elsewhere, looking at the traditions of other countries and tackling the unique problems of our country. A very large country, uh, sparsely populated in parts, highly urbanised in other parts. Uh, we've been leaders in many areas. Distance education was an early example. Interlibrary loans, another example. Many uh, areas that are well regarded internationally. Eh? In recent years, our adoption of technology has been seen as exemplary. And also, for many countries, it's been seen as more achievable. That they look at uh, the United States or the rich Scandinavian countries and feel that that's unachievable. Uh, what we've done in Australia and similarly in New Zealand, in Aust across Australasia, uh, is something that others can aspire to. We're known for being innovative. And I can say that our libraries are pro prospering, even though there are strictures on government funding at all levels of government, and most libraries are government funded. Uh, we are opening new public libraries uh, every month. We have outstanding public libraries across the country. In the last few years, as state librarian, I visited more than half the public libraries in New South Wales. I visited uh, over 190, and uh, they're doing really well. They're really embedded in their communities. I see the investment in libraries by many schools, the investment uh, by universities and colleges, and the way those libraries are changing. Um, it's not too strong uh, to say that it's a golden age for libraries. Special libraries have had a mixed uh, time uh, with uh, the um, closure of much Australian manufacturing, uh, the pullback in government, pullback in other services. But those that have survived have survived by increasing their relevance to their organisations and many are doing very well. We find that our staff are open to change. 
and are requiring ever more diverse skills, both skills uh, with IT, skills with people, skills with their communities, whether they're the communities of an organisation, a university uh, or a local community. And we've seen a dramatic increase and improvement in our services to clients. We've become much more people oriented. Technology has enabled us to put aside many of the things that we used to have to do manually. And although our staff have reduced, uh, staffing numbers have reduced, uh, we've had the opportunity to redirect staff into many uh, areas of benefit to those diverse communities. And we've done that in a time when there's a tsunami of information. Uh, not just the internet, but publication of scholarly journals, a uh, huge range of material out there. Some of it's tendentious, some of it's dangerous, but much is useful, positive and life-affirming. And we're fortunate that we can go and find information just at a few clicks, whether that's for our health, our education, our interests. Uh, it's available to us in a way that it never has been before. We no longer need filters in the way that we used to have them, but we still need filters and guides, and our libraries have stepped up to that, and they're doing that. However, there are some Danger, signs of danger. It's a time when we need to change. There is a continuing decline in the number of special libraries and in the resourcing that special libraries have, particularly in the government sector, but also in the private uh, sectors. School libraries, I see a mixture. I see uh, the um, passing of authority to head masters to principals of schools in some cases means that uh, the school libraries are not supported anymore. At the, but at the same time we see many that are investing in their school libraries and they see them as very much emblematic of the quality of their schools and contributing in a large way to their schools. With library schools we've seen a reduction in the number of library schools perhaps not a bad thing, we probably had too many, but also a decline in their status from independent schools to departments to disciplines within larger departments. And this isn't unique to librarianship, it's happened in many other disciplines, but it, it marks a different status, a different role. Those of us who've been practitioners have failed to manage our suppliers effectively. Uh, I used to be a university librarian and uh, I can say that as university librarians we were not able to adequately manage uh, what was happening in the scholarly journal marketplace. We were being manipulated by large suppliers and as mergers and acquisitions and vertical integration uh, proceeded, uh, we were paying ever more and having fewer choices about where we went and what we got. The same is true uh, in many other uh, research-based institutions. Public libraries, it's particularly visible in uh, e-books and audio books and the market dominance of a few players uh, with absurd conditions and high prices. It's something that we as a profession haven't managed to get on top of. Uh, we've got, many of us got behind the open access movement in the scholarly uh, environment and uh, that's certainly made great progress over the last decade but we're still faced with that problem. There's been a decline in the traditional library workforce, a, a numerical decline in the library workforce because of uh, mainly government stringency, as I mentioned a moment ago, but also a decline in traditional areas, uh, particularly areas like back of house areas like cataloguing and acquisitions. And there's an increased tendency of libraries to hire staff without uh, professional library and information qualifications. 
and at the same time, fewer of us belong to our professional associations, fewer of us uh, are very active within them. These are not unusual. We're in a time of digital disruption, of globalisation, of enormous change. No industry is immune to that change. Uh, the milk industry, which surely must have been uh, a very local industry, dairies, milk turned into uh, fresh products, into cheeses. Now that's swept by globalisation. We're seeing that uh, in a very visible way in what's happened to the incomes of dairy farmers and the price of milk in Coles and Woolworths. But behind that, I've been reading across Australia, New Zealand, in the United States and in Europe, we're seeing globalised companies deciding how that market and that industry will operate. We've seen it you know, in the car industry. Ford has just closed and the others uh, are on their way out because we didn't manage as a nation to have a viable car industry. Some years ago the same happened with uh, clothing and footwear and white goods. The new business models are arising, not just Airbnb and Uber and the other disintermediated uh, in, um, technologies, uh, technology-based industries, but uh, new uh, ways of doing things, sometimes doing things that have never been done before. And we're seeing that across the broad information professions. A recent report from the Reserve Bank uh, put a different um, lens on this. Uh, the assumption had been that what we were seeing was a rise in white collar work at the, and a rapid decline in blue collar work. Well, as you may be able to read on the screen, the Reserve Bank has identified four categories. There's non-routine manual, which has been increasing contrary to routine manual. Non-routine manual is work uh, that requires uh, individual thinking. It's still manual work, but it requires individual intervention and thinking, and that's particularly in health and aged care, uh, that those are growing, similarly in the hospitality industries, while routine manual work is rapidly replaced by machines. But the surprise in the report was that routine cognitive is also going. And I referred a moment ago to what's um, starting to happen in the finance industry. Well, we'll see uh, the same thing happening in our industry, that work that can be done by machines will be done by machines. And that's happening already, it's happened in a large way. Uh, but at the same time, the non-routine cognitive is growing rapidly. That's where there's the thinking challenge and that's clearly where our future is. Routine manual work in our industries has uh, been declining for a long time. When I started as a librarian, we used to have people on the door checking bags as people went out. We introduced tattle tape. Pretty low tech, but it removed a whole class of work. We introduced barcodes, which reduced the processes needed for lending. Now with RFID, uh, we have not only lending, but returning with very little human intervention, or at least staff intervention. Uh, the client still has to do it. And we're starting to see uh, at um, the University of Technology Sydney and Macquarie University large automated storage of large collections. And that is reducing shelving. RFID has the promise of removing uh, stock taking or largely removing those um, chores 
we've seized those opportunities. They've allowed us to cope with declining uh, numbers of staff, but they've also allowed us to do many other things. And those other things have been largely in the uh, non-routine manual, but also the non-routine cognitive. So that's leading to a significant change in the shape of our profession, from one that was more or less um, the shape of a, a pyramid with a large base of low paid staff doing routine activities. We're moving more towards a, uh, a diamond sort of shape uh, with a big growth in the middle. Uh, paraprofessionals upgrading, doing much more and merging into the professional layers, doing those non-routine cognitive tasks. This is common with many industries. We're seeing similar things in uh, areas uh, like aged care and health, uh, the rise of the, um, I'm sorry, the word's gone out of my head, uh, the um, senior nurse, uh, who, nurse practitioners who uh, are merging into uh, the, the medical professions. And, these really have big implications for us. So where do we take a profession that's feeling these challenges in this globalised world, in this time of digital disruption, in this uh, time when there is still a need for intermediaries people who can handle information, who know about it. Well, I think the first thing is openness. We've seen at the economic level a shift towards openness, the dropping of tariff barriers, fewer restrictions on the movement of uh, workforces around the world, uh, more open markets. And in our own world, uh, open access, open source, the move towards things being available without uh, barriers, not just financial barriers, but without uh, technological barriers. In the scholarly world, as I said, we've failed to manage the, the big suppliers. But this move towards openness gives us the hope of doing that and we're being backed by governments. Uh, there's an increasing demand for publicly funded research to be made available to uh, the people who ultimately pay for it, the public. So that leads us to redefining the library and information professional. Our Professional positions have become more varied. They're drawing on the skills of many disciplines. The old barriers that we used no longer are very meaningful. Not only did we draw barriers around what's a librarian, what's not a librarian, but we drew even tighter barriers where we uh, drew artificial distinctions with archivists and record managers, with museologists, with many in IT. We even drew uh, barriers between librarians and teacher librarians. And in pursuit of openness, we can't do that. We need to have open professions, more fluid professions. Our paraprofessionals are becoming more skilled. They're merging into the professional layers. We're seeing significant growth in those middle management, middle professional levels. And we're welcoming staff with a diversity of backgrounds. My time as State Librarian in New South Wales was particularly instructive because in the State Library we employed an incredible diversity of staff. Uh, we had traditional librarians, but we also had archivists, museum people, exhibition designers, graphic designers, writers, uh, communication experts. Uh, a whole range of people who are essential to the enterprise, but only a small proportion of those could be called capital L librarians. 
This leads to a profound rethinking of our professional priorities and professional practice. Uh, National and State Libraries Australasia, NASLA, NISLA, uh, mostly NASLA I think, uh, embarked a few years ago on uh, a process of reimagining its libraries, the peak libraries in the states and territories of Australia and the national libraries of Australia and New Zealand. And they've come a long way in trying to create a single experience, a common experience across those large and diverse libraries. And that in turn has meant big changes for the staff of those libraries. What do our clients want? Well, this word all from a client survey at the State Library of New South Wales shows that they want information. They want collections, at least in that big sort of library. They want access, that was the big word. They do want staff. And in that sort of library, as in uh, many public libraries, they want uh, family history and relevant material. But it's about information, it's about staff, it's about access, it's about people working together around information. So. As we leave the third phase that uh, Jean White was a leader in establishing, where does this profession go? What it will be its fourth phase? Well, I'm, I'm drawing on uh, that well-known international expert, Donald Rumstead, of course, and his famous statement, as we know, there are no unknowns, there are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That's to say we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> I don't know that I'd hold him up as a, a great intellectual guru, but that is a valuable reminder that it's the unknown unknowns that are our real challenges. And for a broad information profession, not just the tight libraries where I started, but broadly across the information, archives, records management, curation, IT. Our future lies in assisting people to engage with the unknown unknowns, to identify them, to find out what they are, and to find, inchingly, in small steps, sometimes with breakthroughs, ways to tackle them. So my thesis is that a 21st century profession needs to be focused on non-routine thinking activities. There is no future for us in trying to do the routine. Even areas that we prized. We used to hold cataloguing as our greatest intellectual achievement. Well, it can be done very easily by machines and on a very large scale. If I might um, divert for a moment, State Library of New South Wales, as with your State Library here and in many other large institutions, has enormous collections. There's no way that they can be catalogued uh, manually. Uh, at the State Library of New South Wales, uh, some 1.6 million uh, photographs. Um, if we're lucky, they're described at the collection level. A few are described individually. There is no way that they can be described. But there's a lot of repetitiveness in there. So using artificial intelligence, using image recognition, we can tackle that issue. And of course, things are used in different ways. People interpret them, they want them in different ways. So cataloguing provides a little window into uh, things. What we need to do is expose them so that people can use them more generally. That brings us to thinking, thinking about systems, thinking about how we manage, not thinking about how do I catalogue this book this photograph, this manuscript. We need to not only 
continue our history of being adaptable, but redouble our efforts and focus on innovation. Be open to ideas, open to new methods, and open to membership, not have a closed profession, but an open profession, a profession that welcomes others into it from diverse backgrounds. We need to be known for our leadership and influence. A couple of months ago I gave a paper on the history of um, libraries' engagement with Indigenous issues in Australia, which has uh, been a rather faltering history. And I started in that by pointing out that we're not visible as part of the solution to Australia's challenges in that important area, that existential area for our country. And we need to be. We need to show leadership. We need to be influential. And that needs to be based firmly in our ethics, our ethics of service to the public and our long-term commitment to keeping the record. Not just the record in terms of uh, valuable old documents, but the record of today. The tweets, the Facebook messages, the data of today. Evaluating what's important to be kept and keeping it. Um, you doubtless are aware uh, that a couple of years ago we had a very regrettable and frightening incident in Martin Place in Sydney with a siege of the Lint Cafe. We've just had the inquest going on. While that was going on, um, one of the staff at the State Library had the wit to turn our Twitter uh, caption mechanism to the hashtags relating to what was going on at that time. During the uh, siege, the alarm, uh, the concern for those um, who were um, hostages, uh, the concerns about what might else be happening in the city because there were rumours of six bombs on the underground railway. And then uh, the relief and horror and then eventually that very hardening I'll ride with you uh, movement that came against uh, Islamophobia. And we collected some 80,000 uh, social media messages uh, during that time. They're incredibly important because they tell of our community today and they're the sort of things that we need to be doing. We need to forget about looking like a duck. We need to forget about trying to have a very tight definition of what it means to be an information worker and to focus on an open profession, a profession that operates in a network fashion as an ecosystem of skills, aptitudes and ethics, a profession for the 21st century. For professional education, that means a change to the sort of things that Jean White was talking about many years ago, to an emphasis on thinking, as these uh, commentators have said, on social intelligence, creativity, perhaps not the complex manual de dexterity, on learning how to learn and problem solving, on being flexible. That will enable us to fulfil Jean White's aspiration to get out of the basement, to have a stronger research base and ultimately a much more pervasive uh, sense of urgency and purpose. Open, innovative, influential, committed to an ethos of preserving and making available information. Thank you. She'll stay up and take some questions. We've got a, um, a roving mic, so so do um, <coughs> please uh, raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment or uh, ask a question. Or we've got um, 
down here. We've got Brian Fuster. And if you could speak into the mic, then responding, we'll get it all on our video. Uh, not, not, not a question, but an observation. Uh, I didn't mention, and it hasn't cropped up in uh, Alex's talk, is the significance of, I think it was 1956, when Jean White got a scholarship to go to America, to the United States, and she, in that year, completed a thesis. She did all the coursework and did a thesis at the University of Chicago. And I think that was the, the, the critical uh, point in her attitude towards education for librarianship, that to that point, uh, Australia had existed under the British system, whereby the association set the exams and therefore qualified people to call themselves librarians. Uh, what Jean observed in, in the United States was the fact that education for librarianship was the preserved of tertiary institutions. So that when, when she came, her thesis incidentally was a comparison of education for librarianship in the United States and Australia. Uh, uh, so when she came back, she was firmly in the American school. And I, I think that colors her subsequent um, talkings and her practice at the Graduate School of Library. Thank you, Alex, for a wonderful presentation and um, covering such a broad area. Uh, it's been very interesting. Um, Brian's just referred to Jean White's experience in Chicago and I wondered whether or not you felt there were uh, important relationships between the education process and the, li the life, the professional life of the librarian. The, obviously, the education system's undergoing massive change. Uh, are there parallels there? Is there symbiosis? What's the future in that relationship, please? Uh, it's something I've had very much in mind in preparing this paper, but also uh, another paper that I'm just finishing on uh, research. And what I've seen in that area is uh, really a, quite a split between uh, the concerns of practitioners and the concerns of academic researchers. Occasional uh, synergies, but often quite different. Uh, the concerns of practitioners are not seen as uh, sufficiently uh, academic uh, to meet the needs of academe, and the products of academe uh, too often seen as uh, not firmly rooted in practice. I think we need to have much better dialogue and to work more closely together on that. There is a ARC project uh, proceeding on that at the moment uh, in the research area. But the same, I think, is true uh, in the area of practice, that uh, we can't see uh, librarianship purely as an academic discipline. And, uh, and I dare say that is true across the information professions. Uh, ultimately, they're applied, they're meta-disciplines, they're disciplines that come to fruition when they're applied to an area of work, a body of knowledge, and uh, so we need uh, engagement between, uh, the, the, between academe and practice. Um, I was very interested to hear you say that the profession needs to be seen to take leadership on some Indigenous issues and happy to hear you say that. I wonder if you have any practical ideas or examples of how that can happen. Um, I meant to say, um, perhaps didn't come through clearly, that I feel we should take e leadership on broader social issues. Uh, where they're relevant and a particular concern of mine for many years has been the um, Indigenous area, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous peoples. Uh, and what brought that to mind was that on the anniversary of Keating's uh, Redfern speech, there was a call uh, for concerted action 
on uh, Aboriginal wellbeing and our bodies were not invited. We weren't seen as relevant and I thought that that was a travesty. I felt that we should have been there. There are things we can do and, and are doing in public libraries, not just sitting back on our laurels and saying, oh, we're open to all, anybody can come <coughs> here, but recognising uh, the results of long-term disadvantage are that people don't come and they don't ask, so you have to go out to, to people. Uh, in large uh, research institutions, uh, fostering traineeships, opening access to collections uh, at the State Library of New South Wales, uh, we held or hold um, some of the very first uh, records of Aboriginal languages, the first time they were written down. But they're not easy to find because they're in uh, records of a mission or a station or uh, surveyor's notebook or some, something else. So exposing things like that, and we've been doing that but working with communities to do that. I have to stop saying we since I'm not there anymore, but <laughs> old habits die hard. I'm not saying that we should interpose ourselves into uh, other people's business. I'm saying we should find the parts of our business that are relevant and uh, pursue those. Uh, similarly, uh, in uh, the, the big issue of literacy, which is very close to us, and the data on Australian literacy is frankly horrifying. And, and that's core business for us. We have to be visible and active in that area. And some of us are, and parts of us are. I'm not painting it all black, but uh, we really do need uh, to be more active. Alex, like you, I started with an electrical engineering degree. Um, and about 1999, I went to the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Department of Electrical Engineering at Melbourne University. And Professor Rod Tucker, who was then the head, talked about how the courses would be changing. And he emphasised problem solving, learning to learn, and also teamwork. And I wonder whether the points that you are making are relevant, certainly to librarianship information work, but also to other bodies who think of themselves as professions. Oh, absolutely, of course. They're the, the way of the future. And that's why I was so interested in that Reserve Bank of Australia study, because it, at a macroeconomic level, really underlined that there is no future in us uh, undertaking routine tasks. We really have to be in the thinking space, and that's true uh, for professions. And we will see professions uh, disappear rapidly. Uh, even some of the quasi-professions, if I can call them that, like real estate, really, do they serve any particular purpose? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, mach machines could do that, and we will we will see them do it. The, it will, our world is changing very rapidly. <laughs> oh, thank you, Alex. Um, the question relates to a general anxiety in the community at large, I think, about whether or not the information, the knowledge that they can access, primarily online, uh, is reliable. And it seems to me as though there's a role for, there's a professional role that's not being addressed there, um, particularly with people aged 50 and over. And I wonder whether you have any thoughts on that. Um, that, that is a, an issue. Uh, it probably comes to, uh, through, uh, to the fore, particularly in health, where we all, or most of us, race off to uh, Mrs. Google and uh, self-diagnose, uh, <coughs> probably erroneously and probably alarming ourselves. Uh, those of us with a little more wit 
at least go to uh, more reliable sources and use it to amplify our knowledge rather than self-diagnose. Uh, we can't uh, take on the job of saying this is good, this is bad, that's beyond us and uh, undesirable. But what we can do is what uh, university libraries have been doing uh, very effectively with their move into uh, information literacy is uh, helping people to develop the skills to understand the characteristics, what tells you that something is more reliable. In the old days, we used to trust things mainly because of their bindings. You know, if it had a good leather binding, that w was good, it was reliable. So Encyclopedia Britannica was held up as being reliable. Well, those who are uh, old like me may remember the great Soviet encyclopedia, which was anything but reliable. Uh, there are hallmarks of reliability and we can teach people those skills. We're seeing it in uh, some of the seniors classes that public libraries are running, but we're probably not reaching the people who we really need to reach through that. Uh, we need to get out from our institutions uh, into the community uh, because that is a core issue. I actually thought you were going to ask a different question. <laughs> about people's concern about surveillance and, and data accumulation. Yeah. And, and again there, it's all we can do is improve people's understanding of that and uh, about how to make yourself less vulnerable uh, to giving away your information or exposing it unnecessarily. And we've got one more question. Yes? Um, you mentioned a concern about the disconnect between um, academics and well, teaching academics and uh, practicing professionals in the industry. Did you have a more specific example of an area of concern where you feel um, you know, st students are being sent out without knowing something or something that they should know, you know, that sort of thing? <laughs> As a student, I'm, I'm concerned. <laughs> keep, keep in mind my lecturers are in the room. And <laughs> I don't know that I can give you a specific example uh, like that because that would uh, focus in too much on particular things. But I, I think what we need is students to come uh, with a broader understanding, the sort of issues that we were talking about in these questions, you know, these big issues, so that they can contextualise and a willingness to learn, uh, come with a, a systems approach but not expecting to know the systems in detail because the systems vary from organisation to organisation, um, often for good reasons, sometimes not, uh, and they're changing all the time but we need a predisposition to learning. For me the saddest thing in being a library manager and director over many years is seeing people who call themselves professionals who stopped learning 20, 30 years ago, they got a qualification. They came and they sit on it forever. That It's a waste of them and it's a waste for the organisation. We need people who are committed to learning and are stimulated by learning. Oh, don't go away. <laughs> um, so uh, I... I it's my uh, pleasure now to uh, thank Alex for his uh, very thoughtful talk. I must admit uh, it was interesting for me as a computer science and that's one of the great things about our faculty that we span from sort of the more technical people through to the, to the well, what used to be archives and records and various other labels that I now know I don't need to worry about knowing because they, all the boundaries are breaking down. So that was really fascinating and I was trying to tweet and also finding it quite interesting to follow that at the same time. And I think that's just an example um, of where things are changing. We've got uh, a live audience. It's fantastic that so many of you um, came out on a, yes, a not such a nice Melbourne evening to be here in person and to uh, 
uh, hear our eminent speaker talk and to also network and share this with each other. We've got a permanent video recording that will go up online and we've had the live Twitter feeds and so on. So we've got that mixed mode and that range of engagement just here tonight, which has been uh, fantastic. So I'd like to uh, thank Alex very much for his talk and to give you a speaker's gift. Just a, a, a few other um, thank yous. Of course, events like this don't happen on their own. I'd particularly like to thank uh, Leanne Waller, who organised everything tonight, including giving me my great speaking notes and my schedule, and we're perfectly on time. So thank you very much, Leanne, for all your hard work. Um, and. Uh, I'd also just like to um, sort of point out that there's a number of people who serve on the White Fund Committee and an ongoing way, uh, John Crosley, Ross, Brian, Sue McKimish, and a number of people who um, keep the activities uh, around the, the research support going and obviously um, the, the White Sisters sort of vision for that ongoing support. There's the people who help with that, so thanks to those committee members. And now I get to wind up by mentioning that there's refreshments which will continue until 8.30 in the atrium, the room off to the side. So please uh, stay around and, and talk with each other and, and look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Thank you.